Hello, hello, rock stars. Welcome back to day three of the 12 days of FMQ FAQ. My name is Holly Ann Knight of String and Story, and it is my job to guide you to quilt with confidence. I am joined today by my silly sidekick, Havana, who is our shop dog, and she thinks it's just totally normal to hang out on the sideboard there because she was raised by cats. So here we are, y'all. Welcome back. Today, we are talking about um, how large of a quilt can you reasonably expect to finish on your home sewing machine. So I'm going to break down some tips on that, speaking from personal experience, um, as well as some important things you need to know about posture in order to protect your body while you're quilting. Because when we're working on big old quilts, it is a whole workout. But before I do that, I have just a couple of reminders for you. First of all, just like Susie did, if you are here with me live or if you're catching me on the replay, go ahead and say hi in the chat. Let me know where you're tuning in from. And if you have questions about quilting large quilts on your domestic machine, go ahead and start dropping those in the chat as well. Now in the caption of this video, you're going to see a few links. So the first link is over to my blog and it is literally a whole post about quilting large quilts on smaller machines and some of my best tips, many of which I'm going to go over with you today. But again, I know that it can be really helpful to read through those. There's a whole other video there where I'm actually quilting on that little Singer sewing machine that I talked about uh, yesterday. And you can see me working on a big quilt on a small machine and talking through some of those posture things. All right. The second link that you are going to find in there is a special invitation for our quilting plan challenge. We already have nearly 200 folks signed up for the challenge that's coming up in a couple of weeks. And I've had had so much fun uh, getting emails back from folks who have registered and being able to respond with videos and responses in response to specific questions and just take some time to welcome everyone into the challenge. So if you are enjoying our time together this week and you want to make sure that our journey continues through the month of August, make sure that at the end of our time together today, you click that link and you go register for the quilting plan challenge. So it'll be happening right here on YouTube. I have a fun, um, workbook for you that you only get if you register. So make sure that you take care of that. Susie, where are you on vacation? Now I'm so curious. The final thing that I want to remind you about before we get started is if you have not already, please hit subscribe here on our YouTube channel. It'll make it easier for you to find me tomorrow and the following days. It'll make sure that you um, are more likely to get notified when I put videos up in the future. It did come to my attention recently that if you actually want a notification when I go live, you have to physically turn that feature on. So I'm not exactly sure where it is, but if you want your phone to like ping you when I go live on YouTube, make sure you turn that on as well. Okay. All right. Let's dive in and talk about uh, the practicality of tackling large quilts on small sewing machines. All right. So as you know, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. I am now quilting on a Bernina uh, 590. This machine has about an eight inch throat. It's a pretty generous throat space as far as domestic machines go. You're on a sailboat in the Puget Sound. I am full of envy, Susie. That's absolutely incredible. Hello, Marie. Hello. Hello. Oh, I'm so glad that y'all are here. Tammy, Susan, Francis, Alicia. Welcome, 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 welcome. All right. So, so this is a larger than average throat space for a domestic machine. Most domestic machines have somewhere between a five and a half and a six and a half inch throat space. So for context, if I can do this without disturbing my watchdog here. Oh, I didn't even have to do that. About the length of this ruler. This is a pretty standard throat space. All right. And then how tall the space is in the harp. So actually up under the machine here is going to play a really key role in the ease of maneuverability as well. All right. The biggest thing that I want to share right from the get-go is you can quilt big quilts on even the smallest of machines. Okay. Just like I mentioned, I've got a video of me working on my Singer, Singer Quantum Stylus 9960 that's in that blog that I linked for y'all. And I have quilted up to double size bed quilts on that machine. Um, and I know folks that with a similar throat space, this you know standard throat space that we are talking about here, have done king size bed quilts. The biggest thing is that you have to make sure you have a good setup and somebody walked by. So off goes okay, Havana. Oh, new people. Uh, there's a German shepherd out there. Havana, that's enough. She does not like other dogs walking by. All right. You need to make sure that you have the right setup. You need to make sure you have the proper posture. That's enough. Be quiet. 
You need to make sure you have proper posture and you need to make sure that you have the patience to take your quilt one step at a time. All right. The throat space is not going to be the limiting factor. It is going to be something you have to work with, right? We want to make sure that we're working with our machines, with our bodies, with our setup, not against them. All right. And those are going to be the three key factors. So let's start at the top with setup and we'll talk about posture and then I'll give you a little pep talk on that patience element. Heavy, come here now. Havana. Pardon me just a moment while I grab her leash because she is going to be insufferable until further notice. You are being very disruptive. I'm in the middle of a thing. Come on, Matt. We're not going to come over here. Nope. You've lost your privilege of being by the door. Thank you. All right. Havana is a good watchdoggy. She, come on. Come on. And she truly, like, if she's, um, like, she has a, a group of dogs she goes and spends time with, like, when we're out of town, she's fine. She just doesn't like dogs walking by the shop. Yes, thank you for letting me know. Okay, so our setup. We talked about this a little bit already this week, but making sure that your body is not the thing supporting the quilt is absolutely key to this whole process, okay? So that means you can't jump that way. You're going to get hurt. Thank you. You're going to sit right there. All right, you sit right there. Making sure that your body is not the thing holding the quilt is going to be absolutely key. So I mentioned yesterday, making sure you have space behind your sewing machine, making sure you have space to the left of your sewing machine where the quilt can be is going to be um, such a relief on your shoulders and on your back. Okay. So this could be as simple as I mentioned on Monday, sliding your sewing machine down to the far right side of the dining room table, right? So that you have the width of the table behind your machine and you have the length over to your left. It doesn't have to be a fancy setup. Your machine doesn't have to be flush with the table. Of course that helps, but even right now, you can see with my machine, my machine is not flush with the table as you just get to see Happy's bum sitting on the desk, right? Um, my machine is not flush with the table because my insert hasn't come in yet. So instead of worrying about making sure that everything is flat, I wanna make sure that there is room for the weight to be supported, okay? Then once I have my machine arranged so that there's space on the table, can you come back over to your spot, please? That would be very helpful. Thank you. Sit down. Sit. Okay. Now you have to have your leash on because you were naughty. All right. Once we've arranged our quilt so that we have this whole table to support our space, we want to think about our body in relation to the machine. Now, right now, if you look at my arm, when I rest my hand on this table, it has a nice 90 degree angle. 90 degree angles are your body's natural resting place. It's a homeostasis for your joints, right? Where you're not going to be getting a lot of strain and you can use your larger muscle groups to maneuver that quilt. But I want you to notice if I actually put my hands up on this quilting surface and turn, we're starting to get, notice how my elbow has dropped, how we've got a, a tighter, a more acute angle, right? And I start to call this the chicken wing effect. And this is really important, particularly if your machine is up on a, on a table and especially if you're on a dining table, all right? Tables that we use for eating are up higher and closer to our bodies so that we you know, don't drip food all down ourselves, right? Versus um, our sewing table, we actually want it to be a little bit lower. So I'm gonna adjust this just a little bit because what I actually need to do is raise up my seat just a little bit so that I'm at this lovely 90 degree angle when I'm at my machine, okay? This then puts that bed of the machine also right at the bottom of my rib cage, right? Um, and in this case, my foot pedal is actually a little bit far away. So it would be ideal for me to put that foot pedal up on a box, perhaps like the box that my uh, laptop is sitting on right now so that my knees and ankles are also at similar 90 degree angles, okay? And this means that I can then quilt in this resting position with a nice tall spine. Notice how my back is nice and tall and I've got my core muscles engaged, right? We don't want to dump our core or be sponsored by the letter C. See how my body starts to look like the letter C here or my spine starts to look like the letter C because the moment we do this, my neck is going to jut out and all of a sudden I'm quilting here. So even if I'm at that 90 degree angle, I'm putting strain all through my neck and shoulders. My shoulders are curled in. All of these muscles are out of alignment. Oh, <laughs> Excuse me, I didn't even have time to warn y'all, all right? So we wanna be sitting up high. So the bottom of our rib cage is even with our quilting surface. 
so that when our hands are resting alongside our quilt, we've got that gentle 90 degree angle and we're sitting up tall and straight, head over shoulders, shoulders over hips, okay? So now we have the weight of the quilt supported by our table. We've got our body in alignment, right? Thank you, Yvonne. And this is gonna allow us as we're moving with a nice flat hand to use the larger muscles of our bicep and our tricep and even a little bit in our forearm in order to control what's going on rather than the tiny muscles that run along the bottom part of our wrist and in our fingers. Okay, when we talked about gloves yesterday, I mentioned that one of the reasons I love these Swan Amity gloves is because they have that nice gentle pad. Oops, that nice gentle pad in the palm, right? So once I have my body all aligned, I can rest my hands gently using the weight of the hand to move the quilt, all right? And you're like, okay, Holly Ann, well, that's great and everything, but what about the big old quilt part, right? We've, sure, we've got the weight supported. Sure, you have your body in alignment, but how are you actually gonna move that big quilt? The moving of the quilt is not very graceful. I'm just gonna be honest. If you go click on the blog post that I shared, literally this section is titled, Push and Shove Everyone. If you're familiar with the comedian Brian Regan, this is um, a reference back to one of his older shows where he does a whole bit about boarding airplanes. Um, if you've never seen that, YouTube it. It's hilarious. Um, but a lot of what's going to go on under this harp space is going to be a lot of pushing and shoving of the quilt, right? We'll turn the quilt so that at any given point, as much of the quilt as possible is sitting back behind your machine. And you only have control of that little triangle that falls between your hands right? So you're going to work slow and steady. And this is where that final piece of the puzzle that I mentioned at the top begins to come in. Patience. You absolutely can quilt very, very large quilts on your sit down machine. Um, if you have been into String and Story on Main, or if you followed along with our rhythm quilt along earlier this year, um, I quilted the large throw, small throw, large throw. It is a 72 inches square a large throw of my rhythm quilt with McTavishing, which is pretty dense quilting right here on this Bernina, right? And that was pretty quick. That was just a couple of days, right? Um, but I've quilted much larger quilts, much more intricately. I had um, my friend Kate Brennan from Orifil look up. I said, how big was Spool? And Spool was 60 by 80 inches. That one took, a, that one took some time. Um, the quilt that will be in the cover image of this, if you come back and watch it later, my choose your own adventure quilt along from the Moda Bake Shop a couple years ago, um, that quilt is about 80 inches square. All right. So these are not enormous quilts. I'm not a person who typically makes really enormous quilts, um, but I certainly have quilted plenty of big quilts on a sit down machine. And I know folks who have done so as well. And that patience is absolutely key. All right. So we support the quilt on the table. We make sure our body is in alignment and then recognizing that this is still a difficult task. It's a physically laborious task. So make, giving yourself permission to work in small chunks of time, 15, 20, 30 minutes at a time, just working section by section, pushing and shoving the quilt to get to the new area you're going to quilt, right? Taking breaks, stretching your body, hydrating, coming back and doing it again. Um, it is a labor of love. It is incredibly rewarding. And I think my favorite piece of this is it debunks the myth that if you are someone who makes big quilts, you absolutely must get a long arm. Now, because I know that this is going to be an important question, right? At what point should you get a long arm, right? If you're someone who makes big quilts and it's in your budget, I think it's worth considering. I know Alicia's tuned in here and she and I just had this conversation last week that Alicia only makes quilts large enough that they could be a marquee. Like she makes very, very large quilts. I'm in deep awe on the regular of this. And, and she asked me, she was like, should I get a long arm? And I was like, I think you of all people would absolutely use it because you make a lot of really big quilts, right? But someone like me that I make, you know, a really big quilt maybe once a year, if that, right? Um, if I wasn't teaching with a long arm, I probably wouldn't advise myself to get a long arm. I make small enough quilts that I don't need one right? And regardless of your average quilt size, I always, always, always recommend learning how to free motion quilt on your domestic machine first, because those quilts um, or those skills will transfer later. Oh, Madeline, I was making a joke, you know, like, like a marquee, like a tent, like Alicia's quilts are really big, but if you were to put up tent poles, you could use it as the marquee. I'm, I'm trying to be silly. <laughs> 
Um, so there, there's kind of my overview, right? We want to support the quilt. We want to support our bodies with healthy posture. And we want to have patience to work a little bit at a time and let those little bits of time add up into doing our whole quilt and finishing it successfully. All right. So a quick overview. What questions can I answer for y'all? Alicia, you're picking it up this weekend. I love that so much. <laughs> Yes, very large, very large. Uh, sorry, I was. It was a vague Harry Potter reference. Everything you said is a confirmation. I was just debating about getting a longer, but I received my answer. Oh, Susie, which way does that confirm for you? I'm very curious now. While you're answering that, I'm actually going to grab one more link for y'all um, because I do think that that's always a relevant conversation. I'm going to drop it in the chat. Um. I have an entire blog on should you buy a long arm, right? Because I think there are two key messages that we are often sold about quilting our own quilts, right? Um, one is that it's very hard and that most people probably can't learn it, which I think is bogus. Um, the other one, I have too many long arm things on my website. Give me just a moment. Should you buy a longer machine? Here we go. Um, one is that it's too hard and that most people probably can't learn. And I think that is absolutely bogus. Um, the other thing is that, if, well, if you are going to quilt your own quilts, you absolutely need a long arm and you need to spend car money on a long arm, right? And I don't think that either of those things are true. Um, so hence the whole, the whole thing. All right, let's see. Kyle says, if you do get a long arm, you should check out long arm preparatory class from Sugar Story. Thank you, Kyle. Which for those of you to whom it would be relevant, Alicia, you may be one of these somebody's. Um, long arm prep will be back in October. Shelly says, what's the difference between a darning foot and an FMQ foot? I have a Janome HD9 and it shows both feet as available for purchase. Um, often one of the differences is whether or not the foot is spring loaded, it, whether or not it hops like we were talking about yesterday. Um, if the darning foot hops, my darning foot for this machine, for my Bernina, happens to hop. So it also works for free motion quilting. But if it is a darning foot, it's my darning foot is stuck to all my so tight. If it is a darning foot that looks something more like this, I do not prefer it for free motion quilting. Um, my experience with the foot that's this shaped is that it's positioning relative to the needle and the angle. Can you see how if it's on the needle shaft? It is going to be, um, Hubster's about to walk in, so Havana's going to lose her mind again. Um, you see how it's at a bit of an angle? My experience with this is that it's too easy for the needle to hit the foot. So look for, look for a foot that has more of that hopping feature. Other than that, it may also be called a darning foot. So yeah, great question, Shelly. Um, that also is a little question, I'm sure, but if I'm doing a custom quilt design as opposed to an all-over design, how long should I allow myself to, my, allow myself to quilt? I'm a total beginner. It's going to depend on the size of the quilt. So I have done, let's say double bed size quilt. So that like 60 by 80 ish size. Um, I have done quilts about that size in a week, but that was very intense physically. You can unclip her since you're here. There was another dog and she was misbehaving and needed to be leashed. Um, and now she's dragging it around causing noise. <laughs> so, so the... So my answer on that is I would consider the fact that if you're a brand, if you're brand new at free motion quilting, your body will probably start to feel pretty strained at between an hour to an hour and a half of quilting a day. I would still break that down into like 20 to 30 minute segments. Um, so I would give yourself some time if you're doing a fully custom quilting plan, assuming this is a large quilt. Okay. Great question. Uh, Susie says, I make quilt size, uh, I make baby size quilts and twin and didn't even attempt a large quilt. I just keep telling myself a long arm would save me so much time, but in all honesty, I don't have the space. And that's the thing, Susie, that's a couple of strikes there, right? Strikes, that sounds so harsh. Um, so I'm gonna put it in quotes to soften that a little bit, right? If you had the space, if you had the finances and you just passionately wanted a long arm, I'd be like, rock on, like you do you. But if you're primarily making smaller quilts and you don't really have the space, it will take you a little bit longer to quilt them on the domestic, but you do not need a long arm, right? And you, in fact, 
will probably derive more joy units from not feeling the pressure to use the long arm, right? And it means that if sometimes you're like, eh, I'm gonna send this quilt out, then like sometimes send it out, that's okay. I have lots of students that have gone through Free Motion Quilting Academy with me that they are like, these are the parameters of the quilts I quilt myself. And sometimes I send it out. If I need it done on a deadline and I don't wanna do it, sometimes I still send it out, you know? And that's okay. It's okay to have the, those guidelines and to do a hybrid, so to speak. Leanne says, if you quilt in small blocks of time, can you take the quilt off the machine and sew? Absolutely. That's one of my favorite things about quilting on the domestic as it's as simple as like leave yourself some thread tails, then cut them, change your foot and carry on. All right. I love that about quilting on the domestic. So I actually, right now I have three different quilts that I'm in the process of free motion quilting on the same machine. And I can just switch back and forth between them. I also have a piecing project. Darcy's been using my machine and it's so much easier to switch back and forth. Hello, Alani. You oh, I'm so, so glad that you are enjoying these lives. That's wonderful. Oh, Marie, if you're not having issues with it, then completely disregard my recommendation. That's the other thing. It's just because I don't like this foot. Marie likes it. So that's one of my favorite things about free motion quilting is that there's very few hard and fast answers right? And you get to experiment. I'm just going to speak from my experience and the experience of my students. And now Marie, who's one of my students has weighed in and been like, I like this foot. So there you go. I love it. Madeline said, when you did a 60 by 80 quilt in a week, how many hours a day did you do it? Like a full eight hours a day. It was probably not a full eight. It was probably four to six. And I was in pain. Like I don't recommend it. I had um, procrastinated on a deadline. Oops. <laughs> Karen says, what are your thoughts about the cutie frame? Um, is the cutie the hoop frame, Karen? Because I have a couple of students who really, really love it. I've never used it, but I know that there are really good resources available. <clears throat> so I know folks that have found it to be a perfect starting place. Absolutely. Liam, will we go over all of which part in FMQA? The answer is probably yes. As long as you're not asking about ruler work, the answer is probably yes. Joy units. Exactly, Susie. All right. So if you have final questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Okay. I love that Kate's here and is like, but it turned out so well. Yeah, that was school that I procrastinated on. <laughs> it was for Kate. Um, I had in my brain that the quilt con deadline was November and that was a lie. It was October. So last week of October last year, was busting, busting that out. Oh, taking the quilt on and off. So taking it on and off on the domestic, yes. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Um, you just give yourself some thread tail, like, you know, some extra thread cut from the machine, pull that thread up. We can set it to the side. Um, as far as taking um, quilts on and off a long arm frame, that would be something we talk about in long arm prep. Great question. Uh, tabletop like a long arm, but smaller. Yeah. So as Yvonne mentioned, generally what I hear is that has its pros and cons, but it can be a good starting place. Um, personally, I don't know the price point of a cutie frame, but if you're going to be looking at um, a smaller frame, I really love that the Handy Quilter Moxie comes on, can come on a five foot frame and it's not tabletop. Um, and personally, I think I would probably consider that but I have space. So I don't, I don't need a tabletop option, right? All right. So rock stars, as a reminder, you absolutely can quilt large bed size quilts on your home sewing machine. I have done it and I have a lot of students who do it. It is primarily what I teach. In order to do this successfully, there are three th key things you need to remember. You need to support the quilt by having space behind your machine and to the left of your machine to hold the bulk of your project. You need to support your body with proper posture and positioning, just like we talked about today, so that you're not putting undue stress on your joints or your neck or your shoulders. Finally, you need to recognize that you're going to have to work a little slower, especially if you're doing a more custom plan on a large quilt. Your primary point of control is within that four or five inches between your hands when they're underneath the machine. And so you're going to work that space, stop, reposition your quilt, and then work again. That takes time. It is still a physically laborious activity. But with a little bit of patience, you absolutely can do it. All right. Yvonne weighs in one last time. The best part about the cutie is the price and it fits in a fairly small space. I love that. Uh, Kate Vernon says the largest quilt she's done on her domestic is 80 by 80. And I think that's really worth noting. That, like that's a big quilt. That's a big quilt. So unless you're exclusively making uh, queen and king size quilts, you have a ton of projects that you can do on your home sewing machine. 
And Kate's getting ready to take on a king size. So we'll maybe we'll do a little uh, interview with Kate when she's done about her tips. <laughs> I love putting you on the spot, Kate. Uh, Sally, hello in Johns Creek. It is great to see you. So Rockstar is the final review of those links down in the caption of this video. First, you will find a link to the blog where I talk about this more extensively, including a video actually demonstrating these properties and how I handle them on a smaller machine. Uh, second of all, you will find a link with an invitation to the Quilting Plan Challenge. This is a free event that by registering, you get a really cool workbook that'll really come in handy as that event kicks off in a couple of weeks. Um, that event is really key if you've ever struggled with the question, what the heck do I quilt where? How do I decide how to quilt my quilt? How do I handle this whole quilt as desired phrase that shows up in all of our quilt patterns, right? Um, and finally, if you have not already, please hit subscribe so that it is easier for you to find future videos. And I will see you tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, oh my goodness, Kyle says, King size in a domestic, you need to put that on YouTube. You could totally do it. Oh, and Alicia weighs in. Alicia's like, Psh, I've done three kings on my domestic. So, there you go, rock stars. Thank you so much for joining me again today. I will see you tomorrow. And until then, happy quilting.